good evening, good morning, good day to you and whatever time you're watching this video at. Um, I found a new filming spot. Um, so I'm sat on the sofa, but the wrong way around. But this actually makes a nice spot, I think. Um, but I wanted to come in and talk about my reading this month. And um, I was reading this, Duck's New Report. Uh, but now I've given up on it today. Was it today I gave up on it or yes yesterday? So yesterday um, morning I was reading it and I got... Um, I do feel like I gave it a good go. So it's a thousand pages and I got 186 pages and then I decided... Um, I was like, I'm not reading this anymore. Um, which I didn't really plan on doing it, on um, giving up on it because... I was enjoying it, um, so that's quite strange for me, but um, I guess I do DNF books quite a lot, uh, but normally I don't DNF, normally I, if I'm not enjoying it, I like try and like skim a couple of pages and see if it's changing and getting a bit better, and then if it's not, I might give up on it, but normally um, I try and get probably about at least a third of the way through a book before I DNF, um, but yeah, so I gave up, and I don't feel bad about it actually, um, some people don't DNF because they're like, oh I'd give up, I'd feel really bad that I didn't give the book justice, but I'm, I picked the book up, like 186 pages of Stream of Consciousness is basically like a Virginia Woolf novel, so um, I feel like I gave the book more than an F due. Um, but it was better than I thought it was going to be, like, from what people have said, this book I thought was going to be, um, kind of like all over the place stream of consciousness, but it wasn't like that. If anything, I find it to be too, um, stagnant and, like, truncated as a stream of consciousness attempt. Um, so this book is about a woman in her 40s, like, she's a housewife, she's a cancer survivor, and she's, um, her life has kind of ended up with her doing baking to make ends meet. So she bakes like tart to tans and stuff like that. And I think from where I got it, it was just, it was still the morning and she was just churning out these baking things. But for what you would have known, she wasn't really baking that much because she barely mentions the actual process of baking. She does talk about food a lot. So I really, really liked her talking about the food and I really liked the woman's perspective and I was really kind of looking forward to the chunkiness of it because I was like I can't wait to just get really wrapped up in this woman's perspective but I find her perspective so limiting that I was like a thousand pages no like she does not I do not owe her a thousand pages of her perspective um but the perspective just changed so the Ohio housewife perspective, I was like, it's so amazing that, um, you know, Lucy Alman shows her narrator as an Ohio housewife, like someone who, you know, society might not say is important enough, you know, to dip into the mind to and spend a thousand pages with her. Lucy Alman is basically saying, uh, no, she is worth a thousand pages. And then when I was reading it, I was like, oh, I was really hoping that she is going to be worth it. But it kind of made out like, from what I read, it kind of made out like, actually, her thoughts are just so mundane that she isn't important. Um, so I don't think it was meant to be doing that, but that's what it felt like it was doing. Because um, I'll read you a bit of the um, page that I gave up on. She's talking about cooking, but she, I think she's baking at this point. But um, most of her baking is done by like a kneading machine. So it isn't really her baking hands on. Um, so even though the book isn't very sensual with the baking, like I was expect, like I was really, really looking forward to that, like the senses and her like kneading the dough and just hearing like the clattering of the kneading, but she never mentioned stuff like that. So I was like, well, you might as well just be sat staring at the wall because for all the thoughts in your head, you're not describing anything that you're doing. So what's the point in baking if you're not going to give me anything of what you're baking. Instead of saying something like, oh, you know, I have a kneading machine. Say like, you know, it does a mechanical word or say something. 
Um, but after like 186 pages of all you've said is like the kneading machine, the kneading machine, the kneading machine. Like I don't give a fuck about the kneading machine. I really don't. <laughs> like you're not even describing it to me. You're just saying the kneading machine. You're, you're not showing me it. You're telling me it. Um, so at this point on the page, she's um, thinking about her husband. So her husband's called Leo and her husband works a lot. So he's not in the house. So basically this page was her kind of th moaning about that. So um, she's cooking, so she's a good cook, supposedly, and she doesn't make this certain meal for her husband because she doesn't want it smelling out the kitchen. So she's going on about tripe and that she makes chicken stock and everyone loves it, but she doesn't like tripe. But her husband loves tripe, so that's what she's moaning about. So she says, the fact that if Leo thinks my chicken stock stinks up the place, wait till he smells a pot of tripe boiling all day. The fact that I don't think you can buy tripe too easily around here anyway, though I never actually tried triped tripod. The fact that I really don't think they sell tripe at Zyker's, but maybe the fact that I wonder if Hogmore has tripe in it. The fact that it sounds like something that might. The fact that I've always been sort of scared of Hogmore. The fact that it's mysterious, like Haggis. The fact that I think maybe that's the real reason Leo sticks with the Philly job. I mean, for the pepper pot soup. The fact that he likes to go out and get pepper pot soup for lunch. The fact that if he left me one day for somebody else who's more willing than me to make pepper pot soup. The fact that then I'd regret not learning how to make it. And then later on down the page. The fact that I wish Leo was here more just to keep me calm. The fact that it's hard to be calm when 93 people get shot dead every day. And there are all these impatient coffee shop clients. And I have a daughter disgusted by my refusal to become vegan. And we got that guy in DC. The fact that I think he plans to just bluff his way through the whole presidency. The fact that he smells so good. Leo, not Trump. DME, pollution, nuclear, war. Um, so I stopped reading at that point because... Um, I mean... To you listening, if you find that really, really good and interesting, maybe you should read this book and you'd enjoy it. But for me, I was like, um, like, I don't know that much about tripe, but from what you're telling me about tripe, it's still not interesting. Like to me, just her thinking, oh, you know, tripe's only going to be in my life because of my husband. I was like, just kind of like, um, like it's meant to be a woman's perspective, but. It didn't seem to be, um, I don't know, questioning, you know, a traditional woman's perspective or what people might think that is. It seemed to be playing into gendered stereotypes that I, I just found quite boring. Um, and like a woman baking, like to me, that's not boring. Like to me, I love that. Like I love Nigella Lawson. I love, um, you know, Julie and Julia with Meryl Streep in where she's cooking the whole time. Like I love baking. So I was really, really looking forward to it. So the fact that the writing just wasn't that great about it um, was really boring. But I was like, maybe Lucy Almond doesn't bake that much and that's why she doesn't mention it. But yeah. And then the bit where it said, though I never actually tried tri tripod, I was like, ooh, that's really cringy wordplay. That's really bad wordplay. Um, and I get that, you know, Joycean stream of consciousness, I think in Finnegan's Wake, I've not read it, but I've read a bit about Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, and he uses wordplay and puns quite a lot, which to me doesn't make him sound interesting. But I don't think the puns are the main point of it. Like the puns are just something in the background, whereas here it's kind of, it stands out really badly. And it's like, no one thinks in their head, like all the time when they're thinking, like on every page of this book, there'll be, well, not every page, but maybe like every third page, there will be a point where she uses wordplay, but really bad and interesting wordplay, like tried, triped, tripod. Like, it's so clunky. No one's mind just thinks like that. Like, here I've got a lamp in front of me. You know, if I'm just in my in my living room normally, when I'm not filming, do I go, you know, lamp, limp, blimp? Like, no, I don't. Like, now I'm filming, so I'm having to think that. So if I was writing a story about filming and thinking that, that would kind of be a bit meta and um, the wordplay would be very conscious. But I don't think subconsciously people think like that, really, do they? So the stream of consciousness felt very, very light. 
Um, so when I was reading it, I was like, because it's a thousand pages, I was like, maybe if it's not going to do good stream of consciousness in depth, it will do it in breadth. And that um, even though it's not that deep thinking generally, it will be um, deep thinking overall. Um, and yeah, but it, it just seemed like every page was basically like the same level and the same kind of thing. So at this point, I got fed up of it. And it see it didn't feel like a 40 year old woman's mind to me. It felt like a woman in her like late 60s because the woman in it wasn't sexual at all. I was like, maybe because she's had cancer now she doesn't care about sex, maybe. But she didn't seem to be discussing that. But maybe she goes on later in the book to discuss that. But there's just bits where she says like, there's one bit where she goes, oh, anal, and then she goes, oh, no, no. And it's meant to be really funny, and it's meant to be like, oh, my gosh, a woman thinking about anal, like, oh, isn't that funny? I was like, not really, like, why wouldn't a woman think about anal? Like, that's a perfectly fine thing for her to think about We're in her thoughts, so she can think about anal as much as she wants. I'd probably prefer reading about her having anal or thinking about anal than her going anal oh no no i'm much too prudish for that so the woman kind of came off like a prude which i don't think she's meant to come off as maybe she's meant to come off as a bit reserved but i was like reserved people do think dirty thoughts all the time though don't they like everyone does pretty much but like it was just like ugh, ugh. but there are like some other narratives in it so the book actually opens with um a description of it's like a mountain lion so the book goes from stream of consciousness into that inside this woman's head and then it breaks it up with this um description of just like a lioness going about her daily life and i wasn't sure if maybe the woman whose head you're in normally if she is like watching a nature documentary but it didn't seem like that but i was like maybe that's what I'm meant to get from it but it doesn't make it clear so that I found weird and just like you can't just throw something at me and expect me to take it like um you know I'm not a sea lion I'm not just gonna jump through all these hoops you keep holding up for me like I'm a reader you should be I don't know I mean but I mean every book's a different experience but like if you feel like the writer's holding up hoops for you to jump through it's like I'm a reader I'm not a a fucking training dummy stop it please and that's what she was kind of doing um, but maybe later on in the book those narratives kind of intertwine more but even from what i read of them i was like i'm not that interested enough to even hear how they mesh together like i'm just not interested but i did think the dynamic of just having a completely different narrative next to another one was really really good but the fact that you don't get that much of the mountain line at all. Like, I mean, I only read under 200 pages out of a thousand page novel, but I think the mountain lion came in maybe like twice or maybe three times. Um, so that's maybe like every 70 pages, maybe. And I'm not going to wait another 70 pages to get hear more about the mountain lion, who I'm much more interested in than you, you boring housewife. Um, but now, so I've read you some of the stream of consciousness, but now here this, um, the writing that was about the lioness. What we prize in poets, the lioness already had. Every muscle toned to tread precisely, every sense alive to wind and moonshine and other creatures, whether rivals or prey. For her, movement was all. She could see, taste, smell it. She reacted faster than she could hear. A mountain lion needs to know how every flower behaves so as not to mistake it for a glint of bare rock or a doe's snout. Um, now that is like, um, I guess like close third person with the mountain lion. Um, but that writing, like that to me, that is way, 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 way better than this stream of consciousness. So I'd have much preferred to read 186 pages just of that kind of writing rather than 186 pages of um, the woman's thoughts because her thoughts were just quite boring, really. Um which is a shame because I was hoping it would be really, really good. Um, but I gave it 186 pages, which I think is a fair attempt. Um, so, yeah, I'm not really regretting that I gave up on it. Do I regret buying it? Not really, because I would have 
still been interested in reading it even if i um even if i saw a video with someone saying they'd gave, given up on it i would still be interested in reading it um so it it is a book that's a bit out of the box but it's not really out of the box because it's a woman's it's just a really boring woman you're following so a boring housewife isn't really that out of the box is it but it could have been out of the box so it's a shame so um like comparing the stream of consciousness in from the page i read which is on page 185 comparing that to um something like virginia wolf's stream of consciousness and i mean you can't really compare two different writers like that but i think comparing a technique you can do that because stream of consciousness is a style it is a technique so i can criticize you for writing stream of consciousness if i don't think it's good stream of consciousness um but just compare the fact that I don't think you can buy tripe too easily around here anyway, though I never actually tried triped tripod. The fact that I really don't think they sell tripe at Zykers, but maybe the fact that I wonder if Hogmore has tripe in it. The fact that it sounds like something that might. Um, compare that to like this by Virginia Woolf. Raising her eyebrows at the discrepancy. That was what she was thinking. This was what she was doing. Ladling out soup. She felt more and more strongly outside that eddy, or as if a shade had fallen and robbed of colour, she saw things truly. The room, she looked round it, was very shabby. There was no beauty anywhere. She forbore to look at Mr Tansley. Nothing seemed to have merged. They all sat separate, and the whole of the effort of merging and flowing and creating rested on her. Again she felt, as a fact without hostility, the sterility of men, for if she did not do it, nobody would do it, and so giving herself the little shake that one gives a watch that has stopped, the old familiar pulse began beating, as the watch begins ticking, one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on and so on, she repeated, listening to it, sheltering and fostering the still feeble pulse as one might guard a weak flame with a newspaper. Like, that is so, so, so much better than the stream of consciousness on that page that I read for you before, which was page 185. Um, like, just the stream of consciousness in this. The perspective was focused, which, I mean, the perspective is pretty consistent in this, but um, all the sentences, it's all meant to be one sentence, like the stream of consciousness bit with her, um, with the woman, but... Um, every instead of using full stops basically lucy elman just uses um the fact that she just uses the fact that like as anaphora to link one sentence to another and no one really thinks like that do they um but even in the bit that i read from virginia wolf um it's like a third person narrator but she goes into this woman's mind and what she does is she uses a specific moment, Wolf uses a specific moment to um, kind of hinge this person to that moment. So even though at that point in the book, that woman whose mind you're following, she feels like out of touch with the room. The moment Virginia Wolf uses is the moment when she's kind of brought back into the room. And um, like people might think, oh, so the woman in it, you know, it sounds very posh, like it's a specific, like, Queen's English that you're thinking of, so it is, um, like, structured in that way, so that is kind of like a false structure, but um, it's still a really good attempt at using words to break down that wall, I think. Um, but I think Virginia Woolf captures, like, one moment brilliantly, and she can just veer onto something else so elegantly and so easily but in this book it doesn't move on very well like she tries to use the anaphora the fact that to shift a thought on but like i think with stream of consciousness like the things you're saying are important but i think the underlying flow beneath the word is just as important as that and in this book it felt like there wasn't any underlying flow um which is a shame so duck's new report um I gave up on you and I don't regret it. So instead of reading Dex Newbyport, 
instead of spending 800 pages carrying reading this, I can spend 800 pages reading probably about four other novels. So at the moment I am reading Threshold by Rob Doyle. Um, so I'm really liking this. This is meant to be a book about um, drugs, like drug taking. So um, Rob Doyle is an Irish novelist. This is his second novel. And what I find interesting about this is that um, normally near the front of the book, it has like the moral rights of the author is asserted and like the publishing date and stuff. But this book literally has... It has none of that. And then it has like the little epigraph there. And then it goes straight into the novel. So it doesn't have like... The legal stuff that it needs to present itself as a novel so i'm like um that's weird i've never seen that in a book before so i don't know if that's a printing error so this must be i did buy this at the end of february and the book was only published in january of 2020 so i don't know if that's something they've addressed now but i had to write in it myself <laughs> when it was published and by whom because I wouldn't know. Like, it doesn't have an ISBN N number or anything, which is crazy to me. Um, but apart from that, I'm really, really loving the book. Um, so, so far, I'm only, like, what is it? 56 pages in. But it's about this guy, and he's... I think he grew up in Dublin, but he hasn't said that much about how he grew up yet. And he's in his mid-30s, I think. So he's kind of, like, given up doing drugs so much now. But he, I think he does them from time from time to time. Um, personally, I've never taken recreational drugs. So um, it doesn't really impress me when writers write about that. But um, I still find it interesting. So um, I'm liking it. And it seems like the first, like, ten pages, he writes about it a lot. So then after that, it's kind of out of the way and he could just talk about it in quite a um, quite a laid back way. He talks about it. So, yeah, I'm really enjoying Threshold and I can't wait to let you know more about it. So, yeah. Have you read Duck's New Report? If you have, what were your thoughts on it? Do you still want to read Duck's New Report? Um, let me know what you think. Um, all right. OK, bye.